Good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Duckers. I'm a professor at uh, Iowa State University in the Department of Animal Science, and I'm one of the co-PIs on the Agriculture Genome Genomes to Phenomes Initiative, which is supported by uh, USDA NIFA. We very appreciate for their for their support. Um, and um, today we are going to talk about. Um, how research on uh, model and non-model plants has been applied in uh, crop improvement. We will have two speakers who will address that. Um, uh, first speaker is Dr. John Sedbrook. He's a professor of genetics at the Illinois State University, where he's using molecular genetic me methods to improve plants for their use in generating biofuels, food, feed, and in industrial products. Um, so he'll uh, uh, proceed with his presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. And if uh, it's immediately relevant to uh, what the speaker is talking to at that, uh, about at that point, I'll, I'll interrupt and ask the question right there. Otherwise, there will be uh, time for questions at the end. But uh, yeah, please enter the questions uh, in the chat uh, to everyone so everybody can see what the questions are. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll address them. So. Um, John, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jack. I very much appreciate the invitation. Thanks, Nicole, for all you've been doing to make this all work. And I want to also thank Pat Schnabel for inviting me. Uh, he can't make it, uh, but maybe looking at the record. Hi, Pat. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for uh, joining today. So uh, let me share my presentation here. I'll be talking about work that we've been doing and domesticating pennycress into a new crop uh, called covercress. And uh, let me go to presentation mode. Um, all right. So uh, as uh, Jack uh, pointed out, I'm at Illinois State University, the other ISU, uh, about five hours drive from uh, Iowa State University, and I've been here since 2003. And uh, uh, what I'll be talking about today is pennycress, so what we've done to develop it into a model by itself and into an oilseed cash cover crop. Uh, and I'll give examples of uh, what we've what has been learned in, in Rabidopsis and other systems that allowed us to really rapidly uh, do this domestication and uh, commercialization. We have two large projects I'll say a little bit about, a uh, USDA funded project and an, a DOE funded project. Uh, and um, and this, so we have to thank uh, very much the funding agencies for supporting this research, uh, as well as our um, industrial partners. So here are the uh, entities that are in involved uh, in academia and uh, government laboratories, USDA, uh, Department of Energy Laboratories, and then our, our close um, commercial partner here, Covercrest Inc., which is in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. So this uh, research began uh, between a partnership with uh, Western Illinois University, us here at Illinois State University and University of Minnesota. Uh, fairly early on, we joined forces with uh, what was known as uh, Arborgenics back then. They've now changed their, their name to Covercrest, and this is what the crop name will be. So our initial uh, grants were from the USDA and we now have a $10 million USDA um, uh, coordinated agricultural project grant to uh, domesticate and well to commercialize uh, the crop in uh, partnership with Covercrest. And then uh, more recently we got a DOE grant uh, about a $13 million grant to improve the abiotic stress resilience of this crop. And so I'll say uh, just some highlights of uh, that research. Uh, a lot of people and institutions are involved. So obviously I can't tell all the stories, but I'll, I'll highlight some of the stories. So just uh, for those of you not familiar with Pennycress, uh, the, the Latin name is Laspi Arbens and uh, it grows on all continents except for Antarctica. It's a uh, brass cluck. Uh, closely, closely related to canola, camelina, carinata, and, and uh, Rhabdopsis thaliana. It uh, grows uh, throughout the world, uh, pretty widespread. And uh, what makes it attractive as a, uh, as a crop, uh, a winter cover crop, is it has extreme cold tolerance. Uh, it has a relatively short life cycle. So in the southern Midwest, it can fit between corn, soybeans, and also in other parts of the world, 
like in Argentina and in Europe uh, and probably and into Asia as well. Uh, it naturally produces a lot of seeds rich in oil and protein. Um, it's uh, easy to con control in, in farm fields. Uh, in most cases, it's not invasive, although um, it may be a problem in some areas, but in the Midwest, it's been here for a long time and it's, it's not a problem. Uh, it has a diploid genome, uh, which has been sequenced and we've actually have a collection of over 800 uh, populations that have been collected around the world. Uh, 400 of those have been sequenced today. We'll, we'll uh, have a goal of sequ sequencing 800 of those in the near term. And uh, the next slide here, I'll say uh, a little bit comparing Pennycrest to Arabidopsis, uh, covering these last two points here. So here's a, a field of our research plots in uh, central Illinois here. Uh, here's a production field uh, in Illinois. This is what the plant looks like. It uh, has these penny-shaped pods, uh, which uh, is where it got its name from. It also has the nickname stinkweed. Uh, because it has a strong uh, mustard smell because of producing a lot of glucosinolate for uh, protection. Uh, here's a seed pod with the seeds. Seeds are only about uh, well, one milligram each, but it produces a lot of seeds. So uh, what uh, I was tasked with doing is, uh, is uh, speaking to how uh, decades of basic research have allowed us to rapidly domesticate and commercialize pennycress. So let me say a little bit about Rhabdopsis thaliana, which uh, many of you uh, hopefully are, or may be familiar with, uh, and compare it to, to, to pennycress. So Rhabdopsis has been studied since, uh, when I say studied, I'm talking molecular type uh, research or genetic type research uh, since the 1960s. So literally decades, uh, I guess we lose track of time here. I'm getting old, I guess. That's what, 60 uh, years or so, uh, people have been doing uh, basic research with Arabidopsis. So a tremendous amount of knowledge has been gained, which has been used uh, for a lot of crops uh, improvement, uh, including what we've done here with Pennycrest. Really Pennycrest, we haven't done any molecular work. Uh, we got involved like uh, around 2000. 10, uh, it got on people's radar in the early 2000s by uh, Terry Isbell and, and colleagues at, University, at um, USDA in uh, Peoria, Illinois, uh, uh, put this on people's radars as a possible oilseed crop. And, um, and then in 2012, we got involved in uh, University of Minnesota in, in my lab in, in uh, Western Illinois University, and we've uh, rapidly made progress here. So life cycle wise, uh, Pennycrest is a rel relatively short life cycle, not as short as Arabidopsis, uh, but short enough where you can make pretty good progress. And this is really the key to, to uh, being able to make uh, rapid improvements. Like Arabidopsis, Pennycrest has a diploid genome. It's maybe, I don't know, four or five times bigger genome, but um, you know, being diploid and self-compatible where it self-pollinates, we, uh, we can have inbred lines and very rapidly um, study things and, and make improvements along with uh, using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So uh, my lab showed that pennycrest can be transformed with agrobacterium uh, floral dip, similar to Arabidopsis, except we have to add a vacuum, which um, is really is not that difficult to do. And, uh, and so between CRISPR gene, gene editing and uh, EMS mutagenesis, we've got huge mutant populations and I've and, uh, been doing both forward and re reverse genetics to uh, rapidly uh, identify agronomically uh, uh, relevant uh, mutations. Here are just some pictures showing Arabidopsis next to pancreas. They grow uh, well together in growth chambers. It's just a you know, bigger plant. Essentially, we uh, I like to think of pennycress as Arabidopsis on steroids. Uh, you know, it's be hard to grow plots like this for Arabidopsis. A little work has been done in that regard. Mostly Arabidopsis has been stuck to the laboratory except for ecological studies, but pennycress works really well as a, a field uh, model organism. And then the seeds, uh, here's seed comparisons to canola. Canola is maybe four times bigger seeds. Uh, uh, and pennycress is, uh, has about the same seed size as camelina, another oil seed crop being developed for the northwestern part of the United States. And uh, they have similar oil and protein composition. Um, you know, canola has been worked on for bread for many years, so it's got more oil and protein, but I'm confident we can get to, to those levels and get bigger seed size as well. I don't have time to show that data, but um, a, lot of, a lot of cool things going on. 
So where is this uh, new crop going to go? Uh, in the Midwest, there's about 80 million acres uh, in the US and all around the world. Uh, as I mentioned, a few other locations, uh, you can be growing this crop, uh, South America and Europe and so on. And so uh, in the lower Midwest, uh, between corn and soybeans, there's a long enough uh, growing season from fall to spring that we can fit uh, domesticated pennygrass. Uh, so that's uh, this area down here. And you'll have to have um, other cropping systems up uh, into Minnesota and uh, Northern Iowa, at least in the near term to, to make it fit. Uh, but most of this land is just sits barren from fall to spring. And this, uh, you know, this unused land is a problem because uh, farmers are a lot of times apply fertilizer or nitrogen in, in the fall and um, or it just sits uh, uh, dorm, or, you know, uh, vacant, they till it. And so you have a lot of problems with uh, soil erosion, with uh, nutrient runoff. And here's uh, just a, a picture showing uh, the um, watershed for the Mississippi River. And uh, the darker the, the, the colors here, the more nitrogen that's uh, flowing in uh, from those fields into the Mississippi River and it's causing this huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's one uh, ecological issue that needs to be improved upon and uh, cover crops like pennycrest can help with that. Uh, so instead of having these bare fields, we could have fields that look like this and um, Right now, the breeding programs have 1,500 pounds of seed uh, yield per acre, which would be over $200 per acre or seed value. And the goal is to be on a, a million or a couple hundred million acres by 2030, which would uh, make it a pretty uh, uh, valuable crop across the entire supply chain. So uh, here's just some pictures showing how cover crust uh, has cover crop uh, benefits. Uh, can be harvested with a combine, uh, just like same combine you use for soybeans. You have to turn down the blower so you don't blow the small seeds out the back. Uh, here's Terry Isabel, who can be considered the, the father of pennycrest from uh, Peoria, Illinois, the USDA there. Some of the early um, harvesting they did with uh, the essentially wild pennycrest. And here's the domesticated pennycrest that we've, um, I, don't, I don't know if people can see my pointer or not. Yep. Okay. So here's the domesticated pennycrest, and I'll, I'll talk about this trade here. Uh, and what you can get is oil. Uh, this is just crushed seed and let the particles settle out. Really nice oil that is uh, well suited for making uh, uh, biodiesel, renewable diesel, and uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And the meal can be used for animal feed, and eventually we'll get uh, regulatory approval for uh, food as well. So just to give you an idea, the, the markets out there for renewable fuels, just aviation alone in the US is about 20 billion gallons are used annually uh, commercially. And uh, when Covercrest is uh, fully uh, deployed, that would be about 3 billion gallons annually. So that's just a fraction of what uh, we need to be getting, getting to sustainable um, you know, fuels that are, have a low carbon intensity. So uh, this is just one of the markets and there, there, there are other markets as well in the diesel landscape. Uh, and anything that we're doing going forward, we need to be thinking about carbon intensity because as you know, climate change is, a, is a causing problems and uh, we have to get carbon emissions under control. So uh, they've done life cycle analysis on uh, the oil, the biofuel produced from pennycrest oil and it has a very low carbon intensity uh, score, which will make it attractive uh, for, uh, you know, uh, companies like, um, you know, ADM and Chevron and, and Bungie that to make these uh, biofuels, uh, they can get a, 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 a extra credit uh, uh, value for having low carbon intensity fuels. Here's a uh, the, some of the people down at Covercrest Inc. Uh, and uh, my lab's within this group too. We've in the, for quite a while, we worked very closely together in, uh, in uh, getting these, uh, identifying the traits and getting them into the, the breeding program. Now uh, here's the, where the initial crop launch area is here. And here's some of the breeding plots from Covercrest uh, in uh, just south of here in Illinois. And so the big news here in August was that uh, Covercrest was acquired by uh, Bayer in uh, a, uh, a partnership with Chevron and Bungie. And so now the entire supply chain is uh, supported and has the resources and expertise 
uh, to, to be able to get this uh, crop on the market. Uh, we're still dealing with some regulatory hurdles um, to, uh, you know, uh, for example, what herbicides uh, are on the label where covercrest can be planted following corn or soybeans, for example. Uh, there's some things with CRISPR gene editing that are, are causing, causing a bit of a headache for regulatory that uh, scientifically don't make sense, the regulations, but um, bottom line is we'll get there. It's just that it's been a bit delayed uh, with these regulatory hurdles to get over in terms of uh, commercialization. So let me get into the agronomic traits that we've uh, been focusing on to uh, domesticate pennycress. I talked about yield. I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit here, but uh, here are the core domestication traits. And if you think about uh, canola, there are two traits that were improved from uh, rapeseed. So rapeseed is the progenitor for uh, canola. It was uh, low, uh, reducing the rustic acid and uh, reducing the uh, glucosinolate content, content. So that's what uh, why canola is called double low. Uh, and so we've made those changes in pennycress. We've also reduced seed coat fiber, which I'll talk about. We're working on earlier maturity to fit it uh, more comfortably between corn, soybeans, uh, larger seed size, bare germination, uh, et cetera. So we've, the short answer is we've got uh, mutations in all that have improved all these traits and um, uh, we've got uh, commercial products uh, ready to go. So uh, in terms of the breeding crow program, the Covercrest has a breeding program, University of Minnesota has a breeding program, and here's just uh, shows you some of the, the data from that program. They really started the program back in 2014, 15, really not that long ago. And now uh, this is already a couple of years old, but uh, this is the number of research plots that are yielding over 1500 pounds of uh, seed per acre, which is uh, what will make this crop profitable across the entire uh, supply chain, uh, including money going to farmers for growing this. So uh, let me say something about the, the traits here. And uh, as I go along here, I'll talk about what uh, we've learned from Arabidopsis and been able to rapidly, uh, you know, apply or translate to, to pennycress. Uh, so we're using uh, two different uh, mutagenesis approaches. One is EMS mutagenesis, which is more of a shotgun approach, uh, creates a lot of mutations throughout the genome. So it's pretty messy. Uh, you get a lot of second site mutations that are not good that uh, make the plants uh, not healthy. But so basically you have to, there's work to, to weed through all that to, to find the, the beneficial mutations. Uh, CRISPR on the other hand is very precise uh, uh, genetic um, uh, mutagenesis. And for those that aren't familiar with CRISPR, it's really a pretty simple uh, machinery. So you've got uh, an enzyme that uh, cuts uh, the, the DNA and you have what's called a guide RNA that uh, binds to the enzyme. And then it has a portion that will specifically match up with your uh, gene of interest or whatever place you want to mut mutagenize. And uh, so you introduce this machinery into the, the organism, whether it be plants or animals, it uh, constantly makes uh, mutations here at that location. And most of the time the cells will fix it, but every once in a while will make uh, an error, either the, a small deletion typically or, or small uh, insertion. And then, so that's what you'd be looking for. And once you've got the mutation, then you can uh, get this machinery out of the plant or animal. And uh, you've got a, a mutation that's really indistinguishable from what you find in nature or what you can uh, uh, introduce with a more traditional mutagenesis, you know, with nature, you know, we don't really have uh, hundreds or thousands of years to, to identify all these mutations. So uh, this definitely is a um, very valuable tool to have. And like I said, it's much more uh, clean and, and uh, precise than uh, EMS mutagenesis. I mean, they're complementary. EMS mutagenesis gives you partial loss of function CRISPR, you can do that, but uh, typically you're getting uh, knockout uh, mutations with these uh, deletions and insertions. So uh, saying a little bit more about the EMS mutant population, we've got uh, over 800 lines that have been whole genome sequenced. And uh, so if, if you've got a gene that's uh, two or three kilobases in size, on average, we've got 17 uh, uh, lines that have uh, mutations. Um, that could be causing phenotypes in uh, that uh, gene. And so uh, this is one approach that was used in Rhabdopsis. Rhabdopsis uh, has done more uh, tDNA uh, mutagenesis and, and then screening through those. Uh, 
Um, we have not done that with uh, Pennycrest because we want uh, mutations that we can then be able to, to put into crops right away. Uh, tDNAs are you know transgenic, so we've um, shied away from doing that. Uh, but this approach, we're basically um, uh, making this mutant gene index, and then you know once you sequence all these uh, mutant lines. Uh, you can just look through the spreadsheet and uh, pick out the lines that have the mutations in your gene of interest, and it's pretty simple to to um, you know get those uh, lines and and start the studying. And so here's uh, one of the early publications on uh, this work here on in 2020. Uh, so essentially, as I said, we've found uh, mutations in many uh, all the core domestication traits from reducing pod chatter to reducing glucosinolate content, to uh, improving oil quality. Um, and uh, we published on that and uh, we now have these different mutations uh, stacked. This has been the focus of University of Minnesota and more as my lab and Covercrest have been fo focusing on uh, CRISPR gene editing. So let me uh, talk about some of the CRISPR uh, editing data that came out of our lab. Uh, so we reduced the uh, rustic acid content of the seed oil and um, also improved the, or increased the oleic acid content. So oleic acid is desirable because it's um, more oxidatively stable. Uh, it's better for cooking, better for conversion to biofuels. And so here's the fatty acid profile for uh, pentacrest seed oil. So here's this, this 22 is a 22 carbon. Uh, this is the rustic acid here. Uh, so these very long chain fatty acids are, are uh, actually regulated in terms of uh, in food and feed because there have been some studies showing that they have anti-nutritional properties. Uh, so that's why uh, rapeseed is not typically used for um, cooking oil or for, for oil for feed and food. Uh, but canola has gotten rid of these, um, these very long chain fatty acids and we've done the same with uh, Pennycrest by knocking out this uh, elongase gene uh, using CRISPR gene editing. And so these, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, while well, you think of them as being heart healthy, they're not good for stability of the oil. So we've reduced these with um, stacking mutations along with FAE1, and that's shown here. I know this is a busy slide, but I just wanna point out the, the genes here. Uh, ROD1 and F8, uh, sorry, ROD1 and um, FAD2 are two genes that when knocked out or knocked down can reduce the polyunsaturated fatty acids and increase oleic. And so we've gotten up to 90% oleic acid content. These plants are not healthy, so we've got to find the sweet spot where we can maximize oleic acid uh, and, and keep the plants healthy. But bottom line is we've got uh, fatty acid profiles that are, are essentially the same as canola. So this is a uh, trait here, uh, our mutation is actually uh, one of the so-called silver, silver, bu silver bullets. So there's not a whole lot of silver bullets where, where things uh, in, you know, work out uh, at, you know, perfectly well, uh, but this is one here. So uh, this one mutation that we introduced with CRISPR, it reduced the C-coat fiber content, improved germination and improved uh, uh, total oil and protein content of the seeds. So uh, to give you a little bit of background information, uh, the seed coats of these brassicas are typically dark colored uh, because they deposit uh, these so-called condensed tannins into the seed coat. So as protection for the, the seed, uh, you know, if you're a weed, uh, you wanna have the seeds sticking around for you know, years in the soil and you need it well protected. And so for the weed, you need this, uh, this condensed tannin and a thick seed coat. But for the crop, we don't need that, right? Because you put the seed in the, the field and you want it to germinate right away. And so um, one, one mutation was able to, to go from this to this, uh, reducing the seed coat fiber, including the condensed tannin by about 40, 45%. And so we would not have been able to make this rapid progress without uh, decades of work in uh, Rabidopsis. So in Arabidopsis, this entire biosynthetic pathway had been worked out already. The transcription factors had been ad identified. And so uh, basically just had to read the literature and, and then you know, target with CRISPR gene editing um, uh, these genes and uh, then you know, assess the phenotypes. So one thing that we did have to do to, to basically advance knowledge is 
you know, field studies were not done with uh, Rabidopsis or, you know, agronomic traits were really not thought of. It was more just the basic understanding of how this uh, pathway works. And so that's what we've been able to, to add by um, identifying and studying uh, these different mutants. So these transcription factors uh, work together here in complexes to regulate uh, biosynthetic uh, genes for condensed tan formation, as well as uh, other things. And actually uh, this uh, gene here, TT8, uh, which is what's going into the, the crop or is in the crop now, uh, not only does it um, uh, or turn on genes that, that form the fiber in the seed coat and the condensed tan, but also negatively regulates um, oil biosynthesis. So that's where a win-win where you get higher oil content and reduce fiber at the same time. Uh, so here, here's a picture of some of the uh, mutations that are typically introduced with uh, CRISPR, just single base insertions and small uh, uh, deletions. And these, these is our data here on the TT8 mutations. So, uh, you know, win-win across the board, we get more fiber, we get less, I'm uh, sorry, uh, less fiber uh, right here, uh, more oil. So here's the, about 10 to 13% uh, more oil in this mutant. And you get this, this uh, very nice uh, golden color for the, the seeds. And then uh, also we get better germination as well. So here's, as I said, that seed coat is protective of the embryo. And uh, so when you, uh, when you make that thinner and get rid of these condensed tannins, which are thought to inhibit germination, you get uh, better germination. In the field here, this is this is the wild uh, variety here, and just this one mutation uh, makes the the stand establishment look like this. It's just really, again, been a very nice uh, mutation. And uh, if you know, I won't show you all the data, but growing side by side, these uh, plants are indis indistinguishable from each other. And you know, that's one thing that is different from Arabidopsis. If you look at the Arabidopsis literature, they say, oh, uh, this TT8 mutants got problems with abiotic stress uh, tolerance, uh, but we have not seen that at all. It's uh, been growing just fine. So actually that's a, a good segue into the, the last part of my, my talk here. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left here. Maybe, Jack, do you, about 10 minutes? All right, wonderful. So uh, that first part I talked about were about uh, $13 million of uh, USDA funding, just as, uh, you know, some highlights of some of the things we did with that uh, in terms of domestication and then now uh, the commercialization of the crop. Now this uh, DOE grant on the other hand is essentially finding the genetics to improve the subsequent generations of the crop. So in particular, this, the focus of this grant is on abiotic stress resilience. So uh, Jack was just uh, uh, noting on how Pennycrest is uh, uh, water logging or you know flood tolerance uh, since uh, Todd is almost underwater there in, in uh, California right now. Uh, and so here these plants don't look so good, uh, but this is very typical what you're seeing, uh, especially in Illinois here where it's pretty flat. You get, um, you know, as the snow melts, you get uh, uh, pooling water and a lot of water logging. Now these plants don't look very good, but they do recover and um, and they do grow. But we want to improve upon that. Uh, and then you know this plant's going through uh, multiple freeze thaw cycles. Uh, it's just amazing what it can go through and still survive. Here's uh, a, a year where it was uh, had a dry spell in the spring, and so uh, you can see uh, this edge effect where there was more more moisture on the edges uh, than in the middle of the plots. Uh, so essentially, we're working to improve drought tolerance. And I mentioned that pancreas has extreme cold tolerance, but uh, the trade-off is, is it doesn't like the heat at all. That's why it's not a, a problem weed because uh, for summer crops, because in the summertime, you just don't see it in the fields. Um, here in the Midwest, it's just too hot for it. Once you get above uh, 32 degrees Celsius, uh, it becomes sterile. And uh, this is becoming more of a problem in the spring where you get these heat waves that come through. So we're working to improve this. And I'll show you some data on the heat tolerance that we found. So this uh, here's just the workflow for this uh, this iPrep project. So integrative Pennycrest re, uh, resilience uh, project, and uh, as I said, there's uh, people across the country involved in this, from the West Coast to uh, the Upper and Lower Midwest. And so we've using both forward and reverse genetic approaches, uh, along with uh, different omics, so metabolomics, proteomics, uh, transcriptomics, and, and phenomics. 
and uh, and looking at both naturally collected populations as well as induced mutations to really find the genetic variants that are going to improve uh, the stress resilience. So, yeah, you don't have to read all this. I guess you can look at it in the recording if you'd like, but let me just give you some ideas on what we're doing. Uh, so uh, here's a map showing just some of the locations where the uh, penny crest has been collected. And, and as I mentioned, we've got uh, over 800 uh, populations that have been collected. And uh, we've got about half of those whole genome sequence, thanks to the Joint Genome Institute and uh, a coordinated, uh, coordinated science project uh, grant that we got. And so our colleagues at um, the DOE Oak Ridge National, National Laboratory down in um, Tennessee uh, have like the world's uh, first or second fastest uh, supercomputer. And they use that uh, computer to do a lot of uh, numbers crunching. Uh, one of the things they're doing is looking at uh, data for climates uh, or environments around the planet. And so, you know, for a given location, you know, where we are here, what the, the temperature range is on any given day or throughout this, the year, uh, moisture, um, you know, all the different um, environmental components uh, make up a, a climate and come up with these so-called climate classes. This is just one of their maps, but they've got even more detailed uh, map splitting and even more detailed uh, differences. And so with this, these uh, different uh, germplasm we have and, and uh, knowing exactly where they were collected, we can then look at the climate type data and say, okay, this region here where it's, uh, you know, in like the Western part of the US, it's typically dry there. So that's a good location to be looking for uh, varieties that have uh, drought tolerance or, uh, and I'll show you data on, on temperature tolerance. And you can probably think of where you'll find plants that are heat tolerant versus cold tolerant um, uh, on, on these climate type maps. So uh, another thing, you know, looking at to the whole genome sequence data, uh, besides the, doing the correlation with different climates, we can look at uh, relationships uh, within uh, North America versus Eurasia. I forgot to mention that uh, pennycress is native to, to uh, Eurasia and was introduced into North America. Uh, the first uh, report of it was in the early 1700s. But so th this data would, turned out to be really surprising for us. So basically this is the genetic relatedness of uh, these different uh, populations that were collected around the world, uh, a principal component analysis. And so uh, you can see that uh, in uh, Iran and, and uh, Armenia, uh, in the Middle East here, there you have outliers in terms of uh, variation. Um, but the, the really cool thing is that what we've collected here in North America, we've essentially we've gotten a lot of the variation that uh, uh, we found to date in, in uh, Europe and, and Asia. That's, you know, there's still more collecting to be done in, in Asia and other parts of the world. But um, uh, what this tells us is that pennycrest probably was introduced into North America multiple times. Uh, our guess is uh, by settlers or, or immigrants that came over and brought their their like seed their seed with them for farming, and with it were hitchhiked uh, pennycrest. So you've got um, a nice uh, variety here uh, variation. So uh, you know, getting back to the climate type uh, analysis, um, we've. Uh, our Oak Ridge uh, uh, colleagues here have given us predictions on which of these uh, lines in our population may have heat tolerance, cold tolerance, uh, drought and, and uh, water logging or flood tolerance. And uh, so here's uh, a plot showing uh, those uh, different um, uh, groupings and, and the overlap. And so we're now uh, studying these different uh, um, traits in uh, this core. Uh, uh, lines here, as well as the entire population. And this is a picture taken just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, in Macomb, Illinois. We've got uh, a, a garden, a uh, common garden plot here with our, our different uh, natural populations and uh, mutants um, there. And so we're, we're collecting tissue throughout the entire plot here for doing uh, transcriptomics and metabolomics type analysis here. Actually, we're gearing up to do that over the next uh, few weeks here. So uh, here's some of the data on the heat uh, tolerance of pennycrest in these natural populations. So we picked the ones in the northern latitude 
and southern latitude. So as you would uh, imagine or hypothesize, the southern latitude should have more heat tolerance than the northern latitude. And that's uh, exactly what we found here, uh, that uh, lines that were collected in California and North Carolina and Alabama uh, showed uh, more um, heat tolerance uh, as measured by pollen viability. So. Uh, we've got a lot more data. This is just a snippet of it, but at 32 degrees Celsius, uh, only about 30% of the pollen survives for this California line, whereas uh, the lines up in uh, in uh, Canada, you get uh, uh, almost all the pollen uh, is, is non-viable, so it's not uh, heat tolerant at all. So we're in the process of uh, identifying the underlying genetics for this, and then uh, these, um, you know, lines can be used to, in the breeding programs to improve um, heat uh, resilience, uh, especially now dealing with climate change. All right, well, in the last few minutes, I'll just show a few more slides uh, about the workflow here. So again, we've got uh, experts uh, within the IPREP group that are doing metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics, and so on. Uh, here's some of the data from this TT8 mutant on metabolomics. So we do see differences between the wild type and um, then these data from all these different omic studies can be fed into the programs that the Oak Ridge folks are using in their supercomputer to find uh, co correlations uh, the, and predictions on uh, what uh, genetic variants are related or underlying uh, different abiotic stress resilience uh, traits. And so that's uh, really the take home of what we're doing. And we've got the, the uh, resources and expertise to do this, uh, including a phenomics uh, um, a facility. So the Danforth Center, Dallin Danforth uh, Plant Research Center down in, in St. Louis um, has some really nice uh, equipment. Well, a lot of people do now for doing uh, throughput phenomics analysis. Uh, we're working with Chris Topps group and they have actually have an x-ray machine as well where they can um, be looking at uh, um, the, essentially the, the morphologies of uh, root systems uh, of these natural populations and of mutants. And, you know, we've uh, again benefit from decades of research in uh, other uh, plants and, and crops. And, 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 you know, as we're developing pennycress as a new crop, we can, you know, do things all at the same time instead of doing it after the fact. So, in, you know, talking about roots, we're looking early on here, finding which um, natural uh, lines give you the, the ideal root um, uh, morphology and architecture to be able to take up nutrients um, and uh, including uh, water and, um, and give you, you know, uh, better yields and resilience uh, against abiotic stress. Uh, so is that it, Jack, or? Um, yeah, if you want to wrap, wrap up, yeah. All right, so uh, just uh, wrapping up here, let me say a little bit about uh, vision for uh, intens intensified and sustainable agricultural systems. So I know we have a lot of people from around the world on this, this uh, meeting here. And so this would be, I'm just giving an example of uh, corn and soybean rotations where, uh, as I said, uh, in the Midwest or Argentina or Europe, uh, you can actually uh, put cover crops, uh, fit them between whatever summer crops you have. Here in the Midwest, we don't have hardly anything on the landscape that's increasing now because of incentives to deal with climate change and, and uh, to, as I said, reduce soil erosion and nutrient runoff. But so here you can see would be domesticated pennycress in the rotation along with winter suri, for example. And uh, there's the products you can be getting from the, the, uh, the cover crest, which is the domesticated penny crest. But, uh, you know, if you're going to be doing rotations here, what can you do with this uh, winter cerite? Some uh, farmers are already using it as an animal feed. Uh, and so we're working to improve winter cerite, uh, not only for feed, but uh, for biogas uh, production. And uh, so, if, you know, biogas is a value added product. And then the CO2 is actually a product now as well where you can sequester that and if you do you can get paid like $85 a ton for securely sequestering CO2. Uh, so these are things for uh, farmers and uh, agribusiness people to be thinking about 
where the value is in these crops going forward and with the emerging markets here and how we can piece everything together to be more sustainable. All right, well, thank you very much everybody for your attention. And um, uh, Jack, I guess I'll give the, the floor back to you here. Um, I don't know if you wanna have questions now or wait till after uh, Todd's presentation. Yeah, we'll have uh, time for some questions now. Um, th thanks very much, John. Very impressive work, uh, you know, and very impactful, obviously. And, um, you know, not, not only, you know, producing more food, feed, biofuel and so on, but it's also uh, look forward to the time where in the winter in Iowa, when you're driving, it's still green. <laughs> so that, that's a big plus too, I think. So, um, Questions, please uh, put them in the chat or we don't have a huge group. So if you just want to speak up, that's fine too. So, um, so we have a question from Srinivas. Uh, nice presentation, John. In some uh, countries, pennycress is classified as an invasive weed species. How to address that? Um, yeah, how, how can that be addressed? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And even in the US here, different states have different uh, designations. And so, for example, uh, Michigan is one state that uh, had uh, pennycress categorized as a noxious weed. But uh, if you talk to farmers, and actually we've been having planting wild pennycress in you know Illinois farm fields for close to a decade now, it's just it's not a problem weed. It's easy to control. It doesn't really spread out of the fields. Um, as I said, there's some places where you want to be careful with, like uh, where you, like, like, I think up in, um, you know, Canada, you want to be careful where you're growing uh, winter wheat, for example, you know, because that's the prime time for when pennycress will be growing. So, but, you know, herbicides can control that well. And, and pennycress is a wimp when it comes to herbicide, um, you know, tolerance. So uh, I guess, you know, this is a effort that we're going through getting it off the noxious weed list here in the Midwest. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in most places it's not a problem weed, but that's a good point. Hey, John, um, one thing that when in our conversations with uh, Covercrest, they've talked a lot about making the argument that since you've changed the seed coat, that it no longer, and I think you mentioned that in your talk, but it seems like that's a really important aspect of the engineering that you've done. That's super. Yeah, Todd, thanks for pointing that out. That's a, that's a really important point to make. And you know, we're actually going through that with USDA um, APHIS, uh, Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service right now. So they do have concerns like uh, uh, the, the, the person that asked the question here about the weediness of this. And, and we've got data showing that uh, that TT8 mutation that uh, uh, th you know, makes the seed coat thinner. Actually, uh, the seeds do not uh, sit in the seed bank. They, you know, we've got years where of data showing that it just does not come up the next following uh, year. So it's it's behaving like a crop plant, just like corn, soybeans, right? So you don't, I mean, corn, soybeans is considered weed if it, corn's popping up in your soybean field. But that's, you know, that's where we are now with this domesticated pennygrass, where it's it's like these other crops, behaving like these other crops. So. <laughs> but if you make it more heat tolerant, could that change? Well, I don't think this is ever going to survive through the summertime, but uh, we just want to make it so that we don't lose uh, yield from these heat spells that occur in the, the spring. Uh, it does yeah. grow throughout the summer at high elevations and up into Canada and even uh, Europe. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think we'll move on. We'll have to, uh, we'll, we'll, there will be some more time for questions uh, also after Todd's uh, presentation that, uh, you know, we may bring John back. Um, so yeah, so our uh, second presentation of the day is uh, by uh, Dr. Todd Michael. Um, Todd is a research professor at the Salk Institute in San Diego. Uh, and he's also a research associate at the San Diego Botanical Garden. And uh, he is going to talk to us about translating model and non-model genomic discoveries to crop plants. So Todd, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is exciting to talk in, um, in this group. Um, and I'm excited to tell you about what we're doing at the SOC in terms of translating um, what we primarily work on, which is models and non-models um, into crops. So my lab, focuses on reading and writing genomes. 
Um, what that means is sequencing genomes and then editing genomes using that information. Um, today, I'm going to specifically focus, though, on the reading part. And in addition to the model plants that I work on, I am interested in many different weird plants. Um, so my lab focuses on sequencing things that are out of the ordinary to understand genome architecture as it relates to phenotypes. So just one example, this one I have up here is Genelisi aurea. It's actually the smallest known angiosperm genome to date. And it doesn't actually make roots. It only makes um, leaves and, um, and then these uh, corkscrew type leaves that go into the soil. It's a carnivorous plant. And so it provides an opportunity to understand what adaptations that plant had to make in order to survive in its very specific circumstance. Um, in general, I'm super excited about plant genomes. My lab also works on other organisms, but really focuses on plants. But plants span all the orders of magnitude in terms of what we know about genome size. And, um, and then in addition, they provide a lot of really interesting complexity, like polyploidy, um, numbers of chromosomes, and then um, in some of our projects, the, just the sheer rearrangements of the genome between even closely related cultivars is fascinating. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you about how we're taking all these discoveries and then putting them into crop plants. And this all really hinges on um, this overarching concept that my lab is using, which is if with the advent of all of these genomes that are coming out, um, high quality genome, both in the crop side, model and non-model sides, how can we leverage that information to then inform how we translate discoveries into crops? And this really is set up as like sort of a cycle. We have the discovery phase where we're doing discovery both in model systems and then also crop systems. And then we use different types of omics type data and informatics to identify orthologs or paralogs. Um, and then we leverage those insights to translate into crops. So this all starts in my lab, at least, with all of these wonderful sequencing platforms. So um, over the years, the sequencing platforms have dramatically changed. We started off with Illumina sequencing, basically short read sequencing. This transformed the way we think about genomes in general. But lately we have um, new technologies, both PacBio and Oxford Nanopore that allow us to generate the highest quality, highest contiguity chromosome resolved and even phased assemblies, which enables us to go in and find specific genes and networks responsible for different traits. I do want to point out that this is the Oxford nanopore sequencer and it's the size of a USB key. Um, and one could imagine that you could be going to the field and actually conducting experiments. And that in my role in uh, the San Diego Botanical Garden, we are um, going and sequencing things in the field. So let me walk you through a little bit of how we actually leverage um, next generation sequencing. So this is sort of a walk through memory lane of uh, sequencing. So we started off with Sanger sequencing, long, high quality reads. Then we got second generation sequencing, which was 454. It gave us longer reads, but the quality of the reads dropped and, <clears throat> and they're actually a little bit shorter. Then Illumina came on the scene generating very short reads, but very high quality, and many, many more than we were getting from Sanger or 454. Finally, we have third generation sequencing, and this is generally single molecule sequencing. So we're looking directly at the strand of DNA, and that allows us to see things like DNA methylation or other aspects of the DNA, but it also allows us to generate high quality genomes. Now, over the years, what we've done is we've used, used this information, first Illumina, to assemble genomes, to identify structural variants and SNPs, but then we can also use that to characterize genes and expression and other features of the genome. And then along with uh, long read sequencing, then we can characterize the epigenome or the chromatin of the genome as well. Taken together, this allows us to quantify the specific features of a genome, both in terms of identification and then also how they function. So now we can 
more accurately identify gene models, promoters, um, repeats, methylated regions, and all of these facets allow us to translate discoveries from models accurately into crops. So over time, as I mentioned, things have changed dramatically. So here I'm showing you that basically you can have very high quality reads with Illumina, but very short, but Oxford Nanopore and PacBio allow you really long reads with lower quality. Because of the computational tools that have been developed over a period of time, now we can leverage these lower quality data sets with long reads to generate very contiguous genome assemblies. So what I'm showing you here is that now we can generate chromosome scale assemblies or contiguous assemblies. And it turns out this is a, makes a big difference in terms of the translation of discoveries into crops. So this is just an example of our pipeline that my lab runs. Basically we sequence, we assemble, this is an assembly graph. When the genome, it doesn't assemble very well, you get all these hairballs and uh, places where the assembler couldn't put it together. But then we can utilize technology like high C scaffolding to put it into chromosomes. And then we go the next step and we can actually do um, cross genome comparisons. Now, just, uh, just as a point of interest, this is actually uh, Pennycrest. So I threw it in here as an um, example of a genome that um, we also work on. Um, and one thing that's super interesting about the Pennycrest genome versus their Abidopsis genome is the amount of repeat sequence that's in there that makes it quite interesting and complex to work on from a genome perspective. So once we do cross genome comparisons, then we do things like single cell sequencing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but this is a newer technology where we can break up the cells, either cells individually or the nuclei from the cells and then sequence that directly and make these maps that tell us exactly which cell types are in that sample that we sequenced. Recently, we were able to leverage our pipeline um, in collaboration with several other groups to finish the Arabidopsis genome. And I point this out because I think John did a great job of sort of showing how Arabidopsis can be used, but even Arabidopsis, even though it's this, one of the smaller model genomes that we have, it still was not complete until we sequenced it and finished it this year. And that was because there are regions that are just very difficult, primarily the centromeres, but there are some other regions that had been left out. Um, so this came from a talk back uh, when um, I was at a plan and, um, plant genome uh, awardee conference back in like the early 2000s and Joe Ecker was giving a talk about how many discoveries that get translated into crops come from our Arabidopsis. And he made this nice parallel, you know, Arabidopsis inside um, for all these crop um, discoveries. And th it, this is more highlighted in um, a grab from M NCBI PubMed where I'm just plotting out the number of publications per species over time. And you can see Arabidopsis is like off the charts. Um, but I wanna highlight that a lot of the crops are starting to pick up and people are actually doing some really fantastic work directly in the crops. And we have been leveraging that by going into SRA or the uh, sequencing read archive and grabbing those data sets. So what I wanna highlight here is there's a massive and growing amount of data sets in the short read archive, um, specifically for um, corn, which is fantastic. All right, so how does our process work? Um, so basically my group both sequences models and non-models and also crops. And when I say sequence, we're not just like sequencing one line where we're basically doing broad surveys of germplasm, land races, wild relatives, um, uh, um, elite cultivars. And then what we do is we put this into our um, process and I'm gonna tell you more about how that process works. And there's this nice cycle of discovery and refinement, leveraging all of the data and cross validating across models and crops. Today, I'm not gonna talk about our field trials, um, but basically that information also feeds back in to how well any given trait concept that we develop works. 
So I want to tell you about how we leverage this. So at the SOC, we've, um, we've been working on this concept, the Harnessing Plants Initiative, which has three layers, um, the coastal plant restoration, plants for the future, and then crops. All three are really focused on combating climate change with plants. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how uh, we're doing that and then show you how we're translating discoveries to impact um, carbon dioxide drawdown. So as every probably, everybody's probably heard, um, right now we're emitting more carbon into the atmosphere than that's getting sequestered. So, you know, plants are a great opportunity to in, increase that um, sequestering of the carbon. It probably goes without saying that plants are the primary driver of biomass on Earth. So this is basically all of the biomass on Earth from this PNAS paper. Um, and on this little square down here is basically all of the animals. So this, this is a great opportunity to leverage plants to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And we know that this will actually work in the broad scale, and maybe we won't want to do it like this, but there's this really nice paper from 2006 in Nature where this aquatic fern, Azala, um, basically created what was called the Azala event, leading to a massive change in the atmosphere. So our general thesis is that we can harness the natural power of plants to rebalance the carbon cycle. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this is the team um, that we put together. These are the plant um, PIs at the Salk. Um, right now, Wolfgang Bush and Joanne Corey are the executive directors of our HPI effort. Um, and each of us play a, a, a different role in this process. My group specifically, as I'm telling you today, works on the genomic aspects and the translation aspects. But we have um, other groups such as Joe Noel group, Joe Noel's group, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about his work um, that is focused on the chemistry of climate change. So I'm gonna focus on two different areas today. Um, since John talked about um, pennycrest, I'm gonna focus on monocots and I'm gonna tell you about how we're working on monocots in both crops and then also um, CPR. So crops is interesting because it, it really is aimed at leveraging what's already existing. So right now, uh, crops cover a large portion of arable land on earth. Now we wanna leverage that and basically scale the, the capture of carbon. And the way that we're gonna do that is by generating or creating plants that have new features. So specifically, we're focused on bigger root systems, deeper root systems, and then adding recalcitrant carbon to those root systems. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. I, actually, the first time I saw this, I wasn't really sure what it was either, um, but it's cantaloupe and it's the skin of cantaloupe. And the skin of cantaloupe is, provides a very interesting secret to what we're working on. Because if you put cantaloupe skin into the compost, it actually doesn't degrade. And that's because it's made up of a substance that we're all probably pretty familiar with, cork. So this is basically a cork oak tree and then a cork um, because cork does not degrade readily um, over time. <clears throat> so it turns out that cork is um, a substance called subrin. And this is um, a a rendering of what subrin might look like, um, but it, it's good in terms of what it actually tells us about the molecule itself. So this is a tightly packed carbon crystalline region that is very hard to degrade. And then it has these um, regions on the outside that basically can be sloughed off or broken off. And what we've seen um, through one of our collaborators is that if you look at really rich humus soil, that this subrin um, that we identify actually is a big um, part of that humus soil. So we think that it's a win-win actually 
to add more super into the soil. So we, we want to engineer plants that not only make bigger roots, deeper roots, but also have a larger amount of subrin so that more carbon is stored in the soil. Um, also, just I should point out that subrin is a natural molecule that already is in plants, as you've seen with both cork oak but, and cantaloupe, but also it's the, the molecule that creates the hosing that allows water to be kept in one place and separated from another place within plants. So we're focused on um, the highest value crops. Like I said, we want it to be scalable. So we want to, we want to go into the crops with the largest acreage. <clears throat> and so what we've done is taken those crops and created a concept of how we can leverage all of the, the crops together to create um, trait concepts. So right now we have a layer of model crops, Arabidopsis, Lotus, Brachypodium, and Soteria. And these represent what we think are like the major areas of um, the, the crop plants. And basically what we're doing is leveraging them into um, the crops of interest like pennycress or soybean. Um, rice is interesting because it really serves as both a model and also um, an opportunity to look specifically at a crop. The same is now emerging with pennycress and we're super excited about John's work in pennycress and also covercress. <clears throat> so how does this work? So these are all the genomes that we um, work on uh, in HPI at the SALK. Um, and what I wanna point out here is that the genomes are related at some level and they can all be traced back to a common ancestor and that's this here Amborella. And so we can leverage this information about how the plants evolved over time through whole genome duplication, fractionization, and then diploidization. And we can leverage that information to identify orthologs. When we identify orthologs, then we can go in and say, okay, are the domains shared across these orthologs? So what I'm showing you here is for one gene that represents all of the orthologs across all of the genomes that we're interested in, we can look at the domains in gray and say, okay, is it shared or not shared? So that's really the first step of deciding, is this actually a good ortholog or not? The second step is looking broadly at gene expression. So I showed you that the number of data sets that are available in SRA are increasing dramatically for crops. So we went through and we basically just harvest all that information and then reprocess it together to identify genes that are expressed at very specific places. So this is a ortholog that we identified and basically this is in canola and we can look across it and say, okay, well, this ortholog is expressed in leaf, this one is in root. And so this gives us a gross estimate of whether this ortholog is active in the tissue that we're interested in improving. We're also leveraging single cell sequencing, like I mentioned earlier. And this is just an example of where we look at a single cell um, atlas from Arabidopsis. And, and specifically, this is a Arabidopsis root. So I wanna remind you, we're interested in making bigger and deeper roots. So most of this that I'm gonna be talking about is in the root. So we can take an Arabidopsis single cell root atlas. And since we know so much in Arabidopsis, about the different cell types. We can then label the different cell types and then we can do the same thing in rice and carry across that information. It doesn't always work perfectly because the root structure is different between Arabidopsis and rice, but it gives us hints as to um, which genes are actually functional in which cell types. And this is key to our engineering strategy. The other thing that we're doing is we're going through very large collections of um, natural lines, uh, land races, wild relatives, elite lines, cultivars. Um, what I'm showing you here is specifically um, soybean and we're growing soybean in a, a substance we call um, turfus. And so basically that allows us to remove the plant and the roots and we can then image the roots. But we have another assay that we call the cylinder assay, 
Um, and I'm showing you here what it looks like when we have it all set up, but this is what the actual um, images look like. And they're actually 3D images of the architecture of the root. We can take that information, we can then measure it. And this is just one of those traits that we're measuring. And then we can leverage that to do GWAS and identify specific genes. You know, this is like a, you know, a tried and true method that people have been using from plants to human. Um, the one really cool innovation here is that the Bush lab at the Salk has really pioneered this cylinder method, which get, allows us to get really nice 3D architecture of the roots themselves. And we have done this across all of the species that I'm talking about, and then we can compare them and see how the GWAS hits align across all of the different species. We also know that the cylinder um, actually works super well because we've actually done some field work in different locations across, um, well, across North and South America. And we get very good um, correlation between what we're seeing in uh, the greenhouse versus what we're seeing in the field. So like I said, I'm gonna focus in on um, monocots today. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna talk about two monocots, that's sorghum and then a non-model monocot, um, typha. So first I'm gonna start with sorghum. Um, sorghum uh, is a excellent and emerging crop that we're working on with uh, Nadia Shakur at the Danforth Center. And ultimately what we're trying to do is, gen I mean, from the HPI perspective, what we really like to do is generate sorghum that can grow on marginal land. Because in California, we have a lot of marginal land that sorghum would be ideal to grow on. And Imperial County in um, California, which is the next county east of San Diego County in California, um, it turns out that uh, sorghum is one of their major crops for silage. So the first thing that we do for most of these studies is we create what we call pan genome. And this is actually a pan genome that was started um, by Todd Mockler's group at uh, the Danforth Center and then sequenced by JGI. And then there were lots of different groups involved over many, many years. Um, this is basically the 10 chromosomes along the top. And then along here, we have all of the different lines that have been sequenced. Um, this is a plot call from GeneSpace by John Lovell. Um, what I want you to take away from this is that there are some really nice structural variation and variants across this population that we then can go in and harvest. Let me show you the pan genome in a slightly different way. So this is a tool that my group is um, uh, building at the SALK. It's called Pancamer, and it allows you very quickly to take a very large group of genomes and then ask, what is the relatedness? Um, and what I'm showing you here is both the public lines that I just showed you, and then some XPVP lines that we've recently sequenced. And we can then quickly see how those XPVP lines are related to the public lines. And we can leverage this information in several different ways. And I'll highlight this more when I talk about typo. But the one way that if you're familiar at all with pan genomes, is that we can then generate this kind of plot, which I call the pan genome rarification plot. The green is basically the core genome, the part of the genome that's shared across all the genomes. And what I wanna point out is that there's a good portion of the pan genome, or basically the unique portion of the genome per line here. And this unique portion is what we're really interested in to identify variants that then we can use to improve sorghum in terms of root biomass. I also wanna point out that if you can, if you look at it a slightly different way, so this is basically um, looking at all the proteins and seeing if they're actually shared across the entire pan genome. So they're shared if they're blue here, and if they're white over here, they're not shared. What this tells me right away is that we have a lot of genetic variation, a lot of gene variation, that we can uh, pull from to improve or um, optimize these plants. The way that we're specifically using the pan genome to edit is, this is an example here, 
of PR3 or pseudo response regulator three or maturity one. So this gene has been shown to um, control uh, flowering time in sorghum. And what we can do is this orange part here is actually all of the genomes. And if it's solid like that, that means that nucleotide in that gene is shared across the entire pan genome. But then we get these dips over here. And what that means is there's variants there. And so we can quickly use this information to go in and identify the variants across the entire pan genome to say, yes, these lines are probably have a different flowering time based on known or novel variants. We also use this to make guides. So we want to identify unique and also uh, non-unique guides to do CRISPR editing. So this tool is very helpful at um, making pan genome CRISPR editing guides. All right, so I wanna move on to um, an example of a non-model that we're translating into models, I mean, into crops. Um, and we're doing this in the coastal plant restoration part. And so the overarching idea of CPR is twofold. The first is what I'm gonna discuss today. We hypothesize that if we're really interested in finding plants with deeper, more recalcitrant uh, carbon filled roots, we should go to the place where they actually exist. And that's in the wetlands. The wetland plants generally have more carbon in their roots than, dry, than uh, um, land-based plants. The second is that there's a lot of carbon stored in wetlands. And we hypothesize that if we could identify the genetic component and restore specific areas with genetically matched species, then those species will stay there longer in that wetland. Um, so this is actually a picture um, of the Mississippi Delta region. And this is colored in terms of the amount of carbon that's actually stored in the Delta itself. So every single time the Delta gets devastated, all this carbon is released into the atmosphere. The problem right now that we have with wetlands is that we are removing them faster than ever because of housing and other human activities. We not only lose the capacity to store carbon when we remove uh, wetlands, but we also release all that carbon into the atmosphere. So we are very interested in leveraging um, our genomic technology to um, to address this issue and identify um, genomically in, um, selected species to repopulate and restore the wetlands. <clears throat> and the reason why we think this is important, and this comes from our collaborators in Louisiana, is that traditionally um, the way that restoration works is like a group says, I'm gonna restore something and then they grow up some plants that they have in the nursery and they, and they plant them in that area um, that they're interested in. Sometimes those plants don't last because they're not genetically matched to their environment. So one of the things that my lab focuses on is leveraging large populations in genomic selection to actually match specific genotypes to specific environments. So I'm gonna tell you a little about this wonderful plant, Typha. If you don't know what Typha is, it's cattail. Cattail pretty much grows everywhere there's water that has nutrients. This is actually cattail growing on the beach you know, close to my house. Um, so it doesn't mind uh, salt um, and it pretty much pops up everywhere. If, if you now take the opportunity to look around, you will see Typha everywhere. So Typha is really interesting It both grows clonally by rhizome. So that's what I'm showing you here, but it also has the wonderful cattail heads that you probably are very familiar with that basically when they explode, they make what looks like wonderful snow. There are 300,000 seeds in every seed head of Typha. So Typha has very aggressive strategies of both genetically um, moving around and also clonally moving around. But the one thing that we thought was very interesting about this, 
that our colleagues told us that what they would really want is typha that would be genetically matched, but not only genetically matched, but that would have rhizomes at very specific distances because typha is what you'd call a, um, a really good terraformer. So it, create, it stops the silt um, as, as the water moves past the plants and it basically builds up land. Now, in some places like Michigan, this is really bad because it basically invades the pond and then the pond goes away. So it can be very invasive. In Southern California, in our wetland area, it's not considered invasive and is actually a very important part of the ecosystem. So Haifa is very interesting because it has wonderful root systems. Now, it's interesting, this picture, I pulled this out of the ground, put it in water, and this is what the roots look like three days later. So all this white root growth is new. It is a phenomenally fast growing plant and these roots are full of subarin. So what we did is we went around um, San Diego County. And so this is basically the Pacific Ocean and San Diego County. And there are these um, areas that we went and collected. So we collected from um, canyons, we collected from lagoons, we collected directly from the ocean like the one I showed you. And what I'm showing you here is the Kamer, pan Kamer pan genome. So like I showed you before, and like I said, this is a very easy tool to then say, how related are these genomes that we have at hand? What I'm showing you is that basically it didn't matter, um, um, it, 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 it matters where we collected the, the sample as to how related things are. So it didn't actually matter like if it, um, uh, if, it was, uh, if it was different or not, it basically, if it was located close to each other, then they're very similar. And this gives us an indication that basically we could leverage this information to execute genomically informed restoration. Um, the other thing that we can get from this is that we can take this pan genome and then we can leverage it to identify and I want you to focus here on introgressions from the genome. So what we found in looking at typha in our region is that there was a lot of in, intercrossing between typha latifolia and typha dominogensis. And it seems as though some very key gene segments have been brought in from latifolia, which is typically a Northern species um, into typha latifolia. And these intergressions represent key innovations specific to those environments. So we can identify those introgressions and then leverage them to do editing and, um, or just matching our genomes with the right environment. The other thing that we've been able to do um, is utilize those genomes to interrogate the, the super and pathway. So as I pointed out to you, um, typha roots have a lot of super. Like in terms of, um, um, Subrin compared to Arabidopsis, it's like tenfold. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the Subrin pathway. And what we found in doing a um, expression study and um, coupled to a PyGCMS or a mass spec analysis of Subrin mon monomers is that this gene, KCS, is correlated with Subrin. Now, KCS is the gene that determines the chain length of the subrin itself. So we think that this gene is actually the innovation that we're going to need in this non-model plant to then manipulate um, crop plants to make longer chain length subrin, which is actually more recalcitrant in the soil. But the one thing we also found out and looking at um, the Subarin pathway. And what I'm showing you here now is a Arabidopsis data. And this is, some people call it a circadian time course. Um, I call it a time of day time course. This is basically under light dark conditions. And this is time of day on the X axis and then expression on the Y axis. And what I'm showing you here is that that pathway that I just showed you, the Subarin pathway, basically is time of day regulated. So I've shown you that um, we're looking at cell-specific expression, but we're also looking at time-of-day expression. Um, 
And well, I'm not showing you here, but we're also leveraging developmental expression. So time of day, cell specific and developmental expression, that is really the key to moving these discoveries from models and non-models into crops. So I'll finish up by saying um, our overarching um, uh, hypothesis is that we, if we leverage models and non-models plus crops and leverage the information in a feedback loop like this, that then we can identify networks that we can then change in those crops, both in a cell specific, time of day specific and development specific way. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the editing today, but we have a very um, aggressive editing program, um, but I think John did a great job of showing and they, they really led the way in, in Pennycrest in terms of their editing, which is fantastic. Um, all right, so I'm gonna finish up with thanking my group so a lot of the genome work that I showed you today, um, other than the genome work that I mentioned from Nadia um, is done by my group here. And I really wanna thank um, the SALK sequencing core. So we work very closely with um, our sequencing core to generate these genomes and data sets. Um, and also the, um, the HPI effort is specifically funded by the Bezos Earth Fund and the Audacious Project. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. Hey, thank you very much, Todd. Uh, fascinating um, information and, and work and uh, another uh, good set of examples of how um, information across model and non-model species can be used to uh, advance crops and, uh, uh, and benefit society. Um, I, I, so again, if you... Uh, in the audience, if you're, uh, you have a question, please uh, you can just speak up or you can put your question in the chat. And I'll pause for a little bit just to uh, give anybody who wants to ask a question just to speak up. Okay, let me uh, uh, start with a question. And, uh, and maybe this is you know both for uh, John and Todd. Um, so what's the what you know now that we can do so much with uh, uh, non-model species? Um, you now what's the future of, for example, Arab Arabidopsis as a model? Do we do we still uh, is the emphasis going to switch that we're going to do more work directly in in, in the plants that we're interested in for uh, for societal reasons? I mean, personally, I hope people still work on Arabidopsis aggressively. Um, you know, there are so many opportunities and tools. Um, you know, it, if you go back to the one graph that I showed um, and the amount of data that's out there and John even highlighted it in terms of their editing and their approaches, you know, we have some really fundamental um, knowledge some real mechanistic knowledge from Arabidopsis. And I think we still have a long way to go, um, but because there's such a, um, a really nice trajectory of data sets, it, you know, it would, it's, I think it's important to continue to build on that data set. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing things in other species, but I, I think as you also saw, you know, we have an increasing number of data sets coming from crop species as well now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to echo what Todd said, and uh, you know, case in point with uh, Brachypodium. So part of the answer has to do with funding. So uh, you know what the agencies are willing to fund, and uh, USDA and DOE in particular, they want everything tied to crop plants. So you know, Brachypodium was is a model species, not a crop, and it was a bit unfortunate that the funding dried up somewhat with BRAC voting because the funding agencies were pushing for the crop plants, like working directly in sorghum and so on. But I think that was a mistake to some extent because you can do a lot of discovery work in these models that still is uh, worth doing and translating to the crops. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, this is a question uh, that I think needs a little bit clarification uh, in, the, in, the, in the chat um, from Sayad Yusuf Dar. Um, so it says, uh, I would like to know 
uh, about the progress and future of this. So, so yeah, could you speak speak to that a little bit more? It's not quite clear, clear what you are exactly referring to. Just unmute, unmute yourself. Is this, am I audible? Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sajad Yusuf. I am from India uh, and I am currently pursuing my master's in genetics and plant breeding. I have started uh, my master's uh, about uh, one or two months ago. So I am taking uh, baby steps into this field. So, Great. Glad you're joining us. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what, what, what is your specific question? Uh, uh, Sar Sarway talking about uh, using these uh, uh, new technologies and uh, these their researches uh, for uh, carbon. I just yeah. Okay. So what I can tell you is that um, one over you know in terms of crops, people haven't really focused too much on roots. It's just been really difficult. Um, so very quickly, we've made early gains on. Uh, large root, deeper roots. Um, there's a lot of potential in terms of, I mean, just regular breeding, right? Leveraging the phenotyping that I talked about and then applying it to crops. Um, you know, we're, we're taking a GMO and non-GMO breeding approach um, to um, improve, make larger and um, deeper roots. In addition, to adding recalcitrant carbon, we have some early evidence, um, actually in Pennycrest, that, um, that we can do that in a very specific way that doesn't hurt the plant, um, which is really what most people are concerned about because you don't wanna express a lot of subarin all over the plant, right? Um, that would actually be bad for the plant. So we have some early data showing that, yes, we can do this. Um, it does increase the subarin, the question now, and we're working closely with the company that John talked about, Covercrest, um, to put those plants in the field to see how they perform. Yes, that was my, actually, that was my question, uh, how far they are being adopted, if there is progress in that. Well, in terms of adoption for, from farmers, I think we're pretty early still. Um, you know, I think we're looking at a 10 to 15 year horizon. You know, there are several efforts in the major ag companies um, and other to improve root architecture, change root architecture for lots of different reasons. Um, um, and carbon capture is just one of them. So I think there's a lot of current progress outside of what we're doing, um, but our efforts are probably 10 to 15 years out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just following up on the, the Subarin story, uh, yeah, I, that's was one question that came to my mind is, yeah, what's the impact of having higher subarin content and roots on uh, yeah, productivity of the plant? But then also, you know, what, what's, the, what's the role of, the natural role of subarin in, in roots? So, um, so first off, to date we haven't, well, if you, if you basically over, produce subarin across the whole plant, the plant's not happy. Any plant that we've looked at. It, so you can only make more subarin in the roots. Um, and we think that it'd be optimal to make it probably at a very specific developmental time. Um, what does subarin actually do? Well, in C4 plants, subarin is really a key part of um, the C4 photosynthesis. In the roots, it does basically the same thing. It is the basically the hosing that keeps the water in place, right? So subarin acts as a barrier molecule in plants, both in the shoots and the roots. Okay. Okay, one last question, anybody. Just speak up. Hi there. Yeah, Hi go there. ahead, Raisa. My yep, name is Grace Dean. Um, I'm calling in today from Barbados, where I work as a plant breeder for a regional plant institute. Um, unfortunately, I did miss the first hour just um, logistically. I did not take into account daylight savings times because we do not roll back clocks over here. Thank you so much for the seminar. I just really have a comment. Um, I'm actually, even though I currently work in the field of agriculture, 
I'm very interested in uh, ecosystem restoration and quite curious about seagrass. And I've been kind of delving, going down that rabbit hole. So I just, I suppose if if you or anyone else has any comments about somebody considering um, applying genomics in that field of restoration, um, what resources would, would do you think I should look into? Um, and in general, what, what do you think is the potential? Do you really believe that um, this uh, genomics can be applied in ecosystem restoration work? Thank you. So I, I, I actually chose to talk about Typha, but I have a Zostra story too. Um, so not only are we working on Typha for like the, the wetland aspect, but we're also working on Zostra. Um, in Southern California, Zostra Marina and Zostra Pacifica make up an important part of the intercoastal um, uh, ecosystem. So currently we are, um, doing the same type of things that I described for Taifa in Zostra. Um, and actually, we have a very similar story. It's, it's, it's actually quite interesting. So Zostra Pacific and Zostra Marina um, hybridize as well. So we think that there's going to be some really interesting ways of looking at these hybrids um, that we're identifying to see, do they actually start to exploit new niches? And can we actually then start to restore as Zostra beds around the region. So, you know, that is actually one of the major restoration efforts that happens here in Southern California um, is, is with Zostra. But to date, they haven't really been trying to replant the same clones in, in the correct places. So that, that project is um, early. We have a graduate student working on it, but we have some really nice genomic resources, um, genomes across the entire Pacific coast, um, and possibly we'll be looking at other seagrasses. So if you're interested, reach out to me um, and we can talk more. Okay. Great. Well, we're over time, so I think we'll have to leave it here. But if there are additional questions uh, for our speakers, uh, just reach out to them. Um, I want to thank both Todd and John for uh, very interesting presentations, a lot of very useful information. And it's, I'm just, you know, coming from the animal side, I'm just... Uh, impressed with the resources that are uh, out there and how they're being, being used on the plant side. And I think we have a long way to go in, in the animal side to, to get there. Uh, but thanks to both of you. Uh, and uh, just to wrap up, um, just want to point out uh, to everybody that we'll have another uh, field day uh, next month, April 19, every third, third Wednesday of the month. So this was our 25th. It's hard to believe that we're over two years into this already. Um, there will be some additional workshops also next month. Uh, they will be uh, announced soon. And then I also want to draw your attention to a conference that we're organizing in Kansas City in June of uh, uh, this year. Um, and you'll get more information on that also. Uh, usual, as usual, if you have any ideas for topics uh, for future field days, uh, please, please reach out and uh, follow our website uh, closely with uh, new information. With that, uh, thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of the day.